Welcome to day two of the UK Stroke Assembly 2015. I'm Peter Rawlinson, and a, as well as being the person that's just doused himself in fizzy water by opening the wrong bottle, I'm your chairman for the day. I'm vice chairman of the Stroke Association. I suffered my stroke on August Bank Holiday 1992. It was about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and you can tell from that that I have a complete and utter understanding as to how life-changing a stroke can be, having, with the help of my wife, Maura, and the family, uh, learnt an awful lot of recovery and compensation and masking techniques over the last almost 23 years. So I'm now vice chairman of the Stroke Association, and as I said earlier, uh, I'm your chairman for the day, and hopefully I can keep you all in order and to time, and yet allow you to have all the opportunities to ask every question that you wish. So I, I hope you enjoyed day one, and I hope you enjoyed dinner last night. So with no further ado then, I'll move on two minutes early, note that when it comes to whatever time I manage to finish the session, to plenary three, which is the difference that stroke research makes. And we have two speakers, Dr. Dale Webb, Director of Research and Information for the Stroke Association, who is our main presenter, and Professor Avril Drummond here on my, life, on my left, who is at uh, Nottingham University, and more important is the chair of the UK Stroke Forum. Avril will speak first, <clears throat> and I'm sure she will never forgive me if I introduce her as Dale's warm-up act, <laughs> so, so I won't. <coughs> so, with the audience laughing and smiling, please note, when I finish with them, over to you, Avril, to start us off. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to sit. I'm not going to stand, because it really does look as if I'm... I'm going to give a lecture then. So, first of all, thank you very much indeed for the invitation uh, to come and meet you all today. And I hope there'll be some time during the, the rest of the day that I can circulate and say hello and, and have a chat with you. Um, it is my privilege to be the chair of the UK Stroke Forum. And I think most of you probably know a little bit about us already. But we are the uh, professional umbrella organisation uh, for stroke. And we have over 30 organisations attached to the Stroke Forum. And so we cover the whole range of specialities professionally that you would hope to see on meet if you had a stroke. So we have membership from all the various types of doctors, nurses, therapists, dietitians. I think if you name it, we've got them. And we have a main meeting every year in December. And actually what we're going to do this morning is we're going to show you a, a clip uh, which tells you probably much more about what we do than me just ranting and, and boring you with words. Um, but really what I want to say is that we really regard you as our sister organisation and we really do want to promote the links between the professional organisation and the patient's assembly. And we want input into what we do and we want to give you input into what you do. And it's a really important relationship to us. So I'm going to dry up now. I'm willing to take any questions or talk to people afterwards. I'm delighted to be Dale's warm-up act this afternoon. I'm going to talk about some of the latest developments in stroke research and one particular area that I know some of you are very keen to hear about. I'm going to try and cover a wide range of topics and also say a little bit about what the Stroke Association is doing with regards to research. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Marvellous. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to set some... Con I, I am wearing a lapel. I'll just stay here, I think. I wanted to move around the stage, but okay, I'll stand still. I, I wanted to set some context, which is um, to ask the question, in the United Kingdom, who actually funds medical research? And the answer is numerous organisations. The charity sector is a significant funder of medical research. In fact, we fund over a third of all publicly supported medical research. £1.3 billion a year is spent by UK charities. 
Industry spends around four billion pounds each year. And the National Institute for Health Research, less than 10 years old, um, funds 1.1 billion pounds. And then various other research uh, uh, councils and organizations also fund medical research. But charities have a significant role to play. Well, does it actually do any good, is the important question to ask. And the answer is yes. There have been numerous studies asking this question. One study about eight or nine years ago looked at cardiovascular health and stroke and said, what's the return on investment for society of spending money on cardiovascular disease and stroke? And it found that for every one pound spent on medical research in those areas, there was a return of investment of 40 pence each year, every year, to the economy. In other words, the return on investment for medical research is easily comparable to other forms of public expenditure. And we know in stroke there's a major return on investment. We also know that every one pound spent on public funding on medical research stimulates up to five pounds of investment by the pharmaceutical industry. So investing in stroke research really does have impacts for patients, for the, the economy and for society. Well, how are we doing in the UK compared with other countries in stroke research? This clever little chart shows an index of numerous countries across the world and orders them with regard to their level of productivity, how many research grants they get, how many publications. And the top country in the world is the United States of America. But the UK comes second. In the UK, we have a fantastic community of dedicated stroke researchers who really do punch above their weight and lead both in the UK and internationally. We should feel very proud of the contribution that they make to stroke research internationally. I want to spend some time talking about research into treating ischemic stroke, so stroke caused by blood clots. And as some of you will know, the main form of treatment for ischemic stroke is something called thrombolysis. It's a way of administering a drug that dissolves these blood clots. A significant step forward for treating stroke patients. And a treatment that is increasingly being used. This is data uh, going back from 2008 to 2014 showing for the four countries of the UK the number of stroke patients being treated with this new treatment, thrombolysis. And you can see uh, important rises over that time. But is the research done? Is that it with regard to thrombolysis? Answer, no. In fact, there's been some recent controversy about the use of thrombolysis. Until about three years ago, the recommendation was that this drug could be administered up to three hours after the onset of stroke symptoms. But on the basis of new evidence, that guidance was changed so that patients can have thrombolysis up to four and a half hours. Now, that's been challenged recently in the medical literature. Um, some people argue the evidence isn't strong enough, that researchers were too, too quick to jump to this. Some people even argue that researchers are too closely involved with the pharmaceutical industry. And next Tuesday on BBC Radio 4, in the evening, you can hear on the File on 4 programme a half-hour discussion on the main drug that's being used, Alteplase, exploring these issues. And because of the controversy around this, an independent inquiry has been looking at this, a panel of experts, to look at the medical evidence, and they're hopefully meeting for the last time in, in two weeks, and we'll then know whether they feel the medical guidance is right. But we have to remember that medical research is a constantly evolving field. So let's explore this question of thrombolysis a little bit more. Part of the problem with thrombolysis is that it can lead to uh, bleeding on the brain. So although we know it improves the recovery of stroke patients, it can also kill. 
And the evidence suggests right now that the benefits outweigh the risks. But there is some research saying, well, what about if we lower the dosage of thrombolysis? Can we see the same benefits, but without the risks of bleeding on the brain? There's also research saying, well, if, if clinicians can manage patients' blood pressure really aggressively and get it down, might that help to reduce bleeding on the brain? And we funded some of that research. We've also funded research saying, can a different drug, tenecteplase, be delivered in a way that's as effective and possibly even safer than alteplase? So it's a constantly evolving field, and therefore right that we look at continually at the medical evidence and update our view on what best practice ought to be. So that's thrombolysis. Well, there has been a... Uh, recent breakthrough in treating ischemic stroke patients, which has taken the stroke world by storm. And that treatment is called thrombectomy. So whereas thrombolysis is about breaking down a clot using drugs, thrombectomy is about physically, manually pulling the clot out of the body. I know some of you are keen to see slides about this. I've been briefed. So um, those of you who are a bit uh, not good with slides that involve blood, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you at the appropriate moment to look away. So essentially, this device goes into the femoral artery, up through the arteries into the bra brain, and there are three, at least three devices on the market right now using a, 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 through a catheter that, that pulls the clot out of the body. I'll show you those in a moment. There have now been seven studies uh, reported worldwide in recent times. The um, first of those was published in the Netherlands. It's called Mr. Clean. Great title for a study. And what it showed is that as we're with thrombolysis, so that's dissol dissolving the clot, about 20% of stroke patients after, after having that treatment went on to independent living. With thrombectomy, it was higher, 33%. And in fact, in some of the studies that have gone on since then, even 40% of patients. And part of the um, significance of thrombectomy is that with large clots, sometimes the kind of clots that can't be easily dissolved in thrombolysis, they can be pulled out in thrombectomy. And doctors are, are uh, showing case studies all over the world of patients who, if they hadn't had thrombectomy, would have had, either would have died or would have had life-changing severe disability. So a, a major, major breakthrough. Well, here are two of the devices that you can see inserted up through the artery and then pulls the clot out. And here's a, sorry, here's a picture with blood coming up next. Do look away if you're a bit nervous. Oh, no, that's still to come, sorry. Here we can see a, a diagram of the, the, um, the stent retrieving device pulling a blood clot out. And then here's the nasty little clot afterwards. It's been pulled out. And a third device, a penumbra device that actually uh, goes up into the artery also. Ooh, oh, it's my screen that's wobbling, not yours, okay. And actually uh, has an aspirator and then actually sucks the blood clots out of the body like that. This really has taken the research world by storm. And in fact, at some of the presentations, this one was taken in, in America in February, you couldn't even get into the room physically to hear the results. People were whooping and cheering from the conference floor. Is the hype worth it, is a question to be asked. And a really important question is, is this a cost-effective thing to do? Well, there's now some research exploring that very question. So some clinicians will say this. To use thrombectomy on one stroke patient will cost around £5,000. Not just for the device, but the whole team that needs to be in place to administer it. And that for an acute stroke patient, for their entire treatment, including thrombectomy, it's around £10,000 per patient. Is that a lot? Well, set that aside, the costs of, of patients who have severe strokes that leave them severely disabled, where nursing home costs are around £50,000 per year forever. So that's part of the debate. 
but there are many, many people who think, who think the evidence is strong enough and the economic evidence is clear that this is a life-saving and cost-effective intervention. Thrombolysis can take up to two hours to dissolve the blood clots. Thrombectomy has been shown in some cases as little as 20 minutes to remove the clot. So a, and we know that time is brain, so this is really significant. How should the... That's a lovely mobile phone tune. <laughs> so is the NHS ready for thrombectomy? That's a big discussion that clinicians are having now. And at the UK Stroke Forum in December, one of the main plenary presentations is all about this topic. I won't go into all of that. There's some quite technical issues around some of the uh, uh, specialist skills that are needed. But for example, right now in London, they're discussing whether in the eight hyper-acute stroke units, patients come through the door, have their brain scans, are first put onto thrombolysis, and if after 20 minutes there's no improvement, whether they then take them by ambulance to a neurological centre to be given thrombectomy. All kinds of conversations. Likewise, I know in Manchester they're discussing it. I'm sure here in Nottingham they're having exactly the same conversations. Really important conversations. Well, and you can see on our website um, further information about these seven studies. Well, that's fine for ischemic stroke, but what about hemorrhagic stroke? There, I think the, 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 the news is less rosy. We haven't really seen major advances in treating hemorrhagic stroke. We know that a large number of stroke patients die of a hemorrhage. It's one of the reasons why the Stroke Association has committed itself to funding a programme of work specifically on hemorrhagic stroke. So we can start to see the kinds of things we're seeing in ischemic stroke, more of those things happening in hemorrhagic stroke. So that's thrombolysis and thrombectomy. Stroke re rehabilitation, Lo lots of things happening here too, which I'm going to go through fairly briskly. This is a, a movement sensing wristwatch. It's some um, research that the Stroke Association is funding. And it monitors the amount of exercise that people are getting in their, uh, in their uh, arms, and it prompts them to increase their level of activity if they're not doing enough and we're exploring whether that device actually is going to help people in their recovery. Another area is this of transcranial magnetic stimulation. And you can see this gentleman smiling <laughs> as he's being uh, stimulated. It's a brain stimulation technique that does two things. It can measure whether uh, the, 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 the rewiring of the brain, what's called neuroplasticity, it could also be used to help stimulate recovery in people's movement. So lots of research looking at this thing called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Other research looking at muscle stimulators to help with people opening their hands and straightening their elbows. Again, this is research that we've funded. And various studies now looking at whether robotics can help in assist people in training of their upper limbs. Many other examples too in the field of, re of, of rehabilitation. I think with the developments of new technology and virtual environments, we're going to see an increasing amount of this, which reminds me of one important thing. If I don't mention this, I'll get beaten up. Won't I? Where is she? There we go, thank you. Okay. Vote Eva Park. There is a, a, a um, technology award going on right now you can vote for, and one of the awards, one of the finalists, is a, an aphasia study that the Stroke Association funded. Eva Park is a virtual communication environment for people with aphasia. Your vote will help raise awareness of aphasia and how technology can help. So please do support this important stroke research study. And I'm talking to, to uh, John and Paula. I know that they've really benefited from being involved in this aphasia study. You can tweet your vote. You can go online. These posters are dotted around the conference venue. Please do vote. OK? My pleasure. 
I want to mention uh, an interesting thing that's coming up right now in the field of prevention. And it's this thing called uh, obstructive sleep apnea. It happens when the walls of the throat relax and it restricts your breathing at night and it can reduce the flow of blood to the brain. It can create spikes in your blood pressure. And the evidence seems to suggest that about three quarters of recurrent, recurrent strokes are associated with sleep apnea. Well, there's been a, an international study going on now for about seven or eight years asking the question, if we use this device called CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, if we use this device, can it actually reduce the incidence of stroke for people who have constructive sleep apnea? That study will be reporting in around about April of next year. And if the answer to that question is yes, that will have significant implications for helping to prevent stroke uh, amongst people who have sleep apnea. Okay, in my last few minutes, I want to say about some of the work that we're doing at the Stroke Association, because we, we, we want to make sure that, that stroke has the same resources, the same expertise and evidence that other clinical conditions. And to do that, we've got to grow the field. We've got to create the next leaders of research into stroke. And back in March, we were delighted to announce the first five winners of a new Stroke Association lectureship program. From an incredibly high caliber field, we selected five individuals who we have confidence in will become senior leaders of stroke in the future, influencing national policy, bringing in huge programs of research that make difference to the lives of stroke survivors and prevent stroke. And you, you can see them here, along with Professor Bath, who's at the back, who gave our keynote lecture uh, this year really important that we start to build the field so we can really get better and stronger evidence. We're also trying to develop um, portfolios of research in neglected areas. I mentioned earlier hemorrhagic stroke, where there is um, far less research than ischemic stroke. But a second area, an area that time and again stroke survivors tell us is important to you, is the whole question of the psychological impact of stroke. We know through various surveys we've conducted, we know through our report called uh, Feeling Overwhelmed, which we published two years ago. This is a major area and a negle neglected area in research. So last autumn, we brought together a range of people, people affected by stroke, clinicians, researchers, and we asked them, what do you think are the main research questions in this area? And I know some people in the room were part of, of, of the, those discussions. And as a consequence of that, we then invited researchers to submit proposals. And at the end of next month, we'll be announcing our first awards. And we're hoping to be able to make around about two million pounds worth of new awards, specifically to address these, uh, these neglected areas of hemorrhagic stroke and the psychological consequences of stroke. So we're really proud of the investments we're making in those areas of need. Okay. Other things that you will see more of from the Stroke Association going forward. We are producing now much more information about the studies we funded. So if you've helped to fundraise for us or donated to us and you want to know what happened to that, what happened to that study, now you can go onto our website and you can find summaries of the findings of our, of our studies. You click onto the research tab on our website. You then click onto our funded <coughs> research and then a tab saying our final report summaries, and you can see there, you can read those summaries of the findings of our studies. Really important that we share that with you. We've also been bringing together policymakers, clinicians, people affected by stroke and researchers to debate important topics. And for example, in, in January, we brought people together to discuss the whole question of vascular dementia, which is the second leading cause of dementia and stroke. And we hope maybe next year to launch a new initiative, bringing together multiple funders that together will co-fund a major programme of research into this other neglected area. Finally, last December, we published new evidence from Oxford University. 
asking the question, how much money is spent in Britain on stroke research compared with other conditions? And what we found is this. We, um, we looked at two time periods, 2007 to 8 and 2012. And we looked at cancer, coronary heart disease, dementia, and stroke. And we can see that the amount of money spent on cancer and coronary heart disease, for example, is significantly greater than that spent on stroke. And yes, there have been improvements, and we welcome those uh, Im improvements in funding. But overall, the level of investment in stroke research is woefully inadequate. I said in my opening slides, we can, we can trust the UK stroke research community. It really is punching above its weight. We need to have greater investment in the UK. So what are we doing about that? Oh, I'm sorry, and this second slide shows you, for every person with a certain condition, how much is spent on research. So for every cancer patient in Britain, £241 is spent on their research. For every stroke patient, it's just £48. We've got to address that, haven't we, really? Redress the balance. Well, what are we doing? We presented this evidence in Parliament to the all-party parliamentary group in December, to the Minister for uh, Life Sciences, George Freeman. We spoke to him and various parliamentarians. Paul... Uh, um, John and Paula Smaker, do you want to stand up? People, I'm sure people do know who you are. Um, came along and they, yeah, please do give them a round of applause. <laughs> they spoke to parliamentarians and said how important it was to have stroke research and how much they had enjoyed being part of it. We've been working with the governments in Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland with new funding commitments to fund lecture, lecturer positions in those countries. We've been working with the government in Wales to help write its new stroke research strategy, which we're launching uh, in, in September. We're hosting an event at the Scottish Parliament in September with the, minister, the health minister there to, to, to celebrate our, our funding collaboration and, again, try and stimulate greater investment in stroke research. And this is the only really texty slide I have, but we're saying four things. The stroke research community has won major breakthroughs with fairly modest resource. Despite recent improvements in UK funding levels, the spend on stroke research still lags behind conditions with a comparable disease burden. The burden of stroke disease is set to double worldwide by 2030. We need a major shift in investment and we're calling for a doubling in the spend to £112 million by 2020. That's going to be tough in the current economic environment, but it's a, it's a challenge we're not going to shirk away from at the Stroke Association, and we welcome your involvement to join our campaigning network and help us in our efforts to stimulate greater investment into stroke research. I finally want to just to conclude by reminding you that we at the Stroke Association do also provide other services. Our national helpline uh, is available, and our team of trained, dedicated staff are always there to talk to you about a whole range of issues. And we have a whole range of fact sheets too, and in fact, a new set of fact sheets, and here's one of our latest ones on helping people with communication problems. Thank you for listening. I hope that's been of interest to you, and uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dale, and thank you very much, Avril, for introducing such an interesting speaker to us. Um, we now move to uh, questions. We have about uh, 20 minutes for that, and therefore, logistically, um, can I just remind you that if you need help with uh, asking any of your questions, then please either write them down on a piece of paper and wave them, and someone will come and pick that up and ask the question for you. Or if you want to join the, the tables down here with the orange banners on where there are assistants to uh, help you ask your questions, then please do. So now, for those of you who have memories as long as mine, we will move to the part of the session that the man in the old city varieties uh, Paul Leeds used to say is chiefly yourselves. And I'll get, take a first question from over here, if the microphone could go there. And then there's a second question at the back on the left that I'll come to later. And then there's a third question down here. So, sir. The microphone should be live. Hello? Yeah, right. 
<laughs> <Hello. laughs> um, it's a comment, really. Um, please, please. I, sh I said, I, I know that um, research is good, but um, don't forget the survivors. Thank you very much for that, sir. Can we take the question at the back, and then the next question will be down here, and then there's a question with a white, white haired, ge white haired gentleman, if he doesn't mind me saying so, in the middle. There will be the question after that. So the question from this table. No, the question, question here first. Okay, all right. I'll start. Oh, no, sorry, I beg you, I beg your pardon. I did say. I'm... I was just going to start eating it. Go, go ahead, sir. I'm from North East England, and today is actually the opening of the new specialist emergency care hospital at Cramlington, um, which is a, it's a breakthrough in, in, in medicine. Uh, do you know if any of these thrombolectomy and things like that are being carried out in this brand new hospital that's opening today? So the question is, is the clot pulling technique Available in the new hospital to be opened in the northeast. Yeah. Um, no idea. I, it's probably yeah, the no. short answer. <laughs> Sorry, I, I really don't know. But I think one thing that um, we do need to say is that this is a highly skilled technique. So we've had the results of trials, but this isn't something your average doctor is going to be able to do. So there are issues about training people and for manpower in order to roll <coughs> these techniques out. So I have actually no idea uh, of the numbers of people in the UK who can actually perform these techniques but it's not going to be huge numbers and certainly one of the issues going forward is how we train enough people to be able to undertake this. So specific hospitals I can't comment on, but I can say I know we're going to have a shortage of people to do this even before we even start. Were you indicating, sir, that you know something on the subject? Absolutely. Just sh shout and I'll repeat then. will not be able to actually do that treatment. It's going to be, have to be the RVI with the neuro, the the neuro side of it. So our correspondent on the spot <laughs> reports <laughs> that in the northeast, the RVI hospital has got the medical and technical capability to do this, but the others don't at this stage. So I hope that's an answer to your question, sir. And then I've indicated the next question will be here. Then there's a gentleman there. Okay. He would like another one as well. Um, just to talk about sleep, sleep apnea again, to, to come back to that. I discovered, or somebody discovered, that I actually got this, this thing. And uh, so eventually I went to Leeds to uh, see the hospital there. And they said apparently I was having uh, spikes about 12 a night. So I know, now I use one of these machines, you'll never get a decent night's sleep, but at least you will actually only have one, st one a night. So therefore it must be doing good. Um, and quite apparently you only have to use it for about five hours a night. So at least after that, for three hours, I go a decent night's sleep. But, uh, you know, the, it does work, or it seems to work anyway. And I don't feel any better or any worse, but it's, presumably it's doing me good. So I thought you'd be interested about the fact. That, and I'm sure there are other people in the room who've also got a sleep apnea. And as it happens, both I and my friend here, we both went to the... Uh, yeah. uh, oh, the... the, the uh, oh, the, 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 the Leeds... Sorry, sorry, oh, this... Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank sir. You. And you can tell that the way that this question and answer session is evolving, it is chiefly about yourselves, because we do have a lot of direct experience in the room that can answer these questions. So we have the next question here, and then there's a gentleman who is either doing calisthenics or is being very persistent in wanting <laughs> to ask the question after that. And then I think I saw a lady over there, if you don't mind me saying, madam, with the white hair and the uh, uh, hooped sweater will be the question after that. So one, two, and three. 
Uh, hello, uh, I'm Alan Moore from the East of England, but I've been involved with um, health research for some, some years because of stroke. Um, the question is, um, you said there are about three or four different sources of uh, research funding and support, but what can we do to coordinate them? The reason I ask is that um, I've seen both through the um, assessment of research projects and also through one I'm currently involved in, the draft one, that um, if, if, the, if the particular study doesn't properly fit one uh, box, so to speak, uh, it has to apply again for another box. Um, this is the case, um, the first, first we've gone through the um, Health Technology uh, Agency to try and get some money from the NICR, um, NACHR. The second one is um, going through the Research for Public Benefit, benefit, benefit Research for Public Benefit. Um, all over again, you know, each, each, time, each, each application takes about a year and um, defer, defer saying yes or no on the um, study rather than actually question, sorry, wrong box sort of thing. So what can we do to, to improve the coordination of studies and make sure that um, studies themselves have more, more chance of, um, if they're good ones, getting the funding and the support early on rather than you know, taking years to get started? So I think the question, if you don't mind me uh, condensing it, sir, is what are we doing to improve the quality of research and ensuring that coordination, coordination of research to, to ensure that the best outcomes are deployed for the, for the interests of the widest part of the population? Is that correct, sir? Who would yeah. like to? Yeah, you, you raise a really important uh, point, and thank you for that. It's challenging for researchers with so many different funders funding different kinds of things to navigate their way around them. So some of the work that we're doing to improve that, two things really. So most of the research that we fund at the Stroke Association are small scale pilot studies, taking new ideas and, and giving them a try. And typically we won't fund the larger scale versions of those studies, although sometimes we have. So our job is to work with NAHR in particular, the National Institute for Health Research, to, to make them aware of our portfolio of studies, to share with them emerging results as they come through, so that they are well cited of those things and then can, can, uh, can, that can stimulate uh, studies at larger scale. It's quite hard to do that because when I talk to NAHR, they only want to know about studies that are finished and reported. Whereas what we're trying to do is reduce the time lag between the study we're currently funding, which we think has promise, and getting it quickly into a larger scale one. So that's a challenge. And before we move on from the answer to that question, I see Professor Philip Bath at the back trying to attract my attention. He will be one of the starring acts later in the proceedings, but I think you want to add something to this subject? Um, I was just going to comment on this um, Cramlington Hospital, which I'd never heard of, but I've just been looking at very quickly on the web. It is north of Newcastle. It's in uh, Northumbria, and it serves a different clientele. It is fascinating because it's a 24-7 hospital, so David Cameron will get his way by the looks of it. Everybody's going to go in there knowing they're 24-7 working. It will take strokes, but what it doesn't go into is detail about thrombectomy. But having spent a minute looking at this, if these guys can't do it in the next three years, then the rest of us are going to struggle because it, the way they're set up, it looks like they jolly well ought to be. Okay, thank you for that. Can I just, just complete the answer, sorry. Yeah. Just, the second part of your answer, which is about um, relationships between funders. So at the Stroke Association, we've developed funding partnerships with the Alzheimer's Society, with the British Heart Foundation, and with the Medical Research Council. We want to do more of that, bringing par parties together to stimulate funding from each other. So I mentioned in my presentation, we're hoping next year to launch a new program of work into vascular dementia research, bringing at least two other funders. So we are trying to, to do more work in partnership, but it's a very good question. Thank you. So I'm going to take the next question from here, but just before you ask, sir, I'm reminding, I'm going to the lady over here after that, and then I'd invite a question from either the middle or Thank you to make the logistics more easy. The smiling lady uh, with her hand in the air at the back will be the third question. So, sir, over to you for your question. Um, quick question. Is this the clot pulling very similar to the angioplasty? You know, when you're in you the heart side, and can't the same equipment be used, which might save time, money, and effort? Because you've got the skills in many hospitals, especially like in Wolverhampton, where I come from. Uh, they've got a very good health the heart uh, department there. They've also got a stroke department next to it. Can this clock pulling be done with the same equipment? Uh, interesting question. Philip, do you want to take, up, take that one? Thanks. It's a fascinating question. 
Um, and we might be able to talk about this later at the, the, the final session about asking questions. Um, but briefly, there's a lot of debate around the world about this, and there's a lot of politics, and I hate to raise politics, um, turf wars and things like that, which you do not want to hear about. The equipment is not the same, so our cardiac centre uh, up the road from here does not have the equipment that our neuroradiologists, in other words, the brain uh, x-ray doctors who want to go in and pull the clot, it's not the same equipment. <laughs> Um, so there is a lot of debate about whether you could use the cardiac equipment. There is debate about whether cardiologists should be going into the brain or indeed neuroradiologists should be going into the heart because in an extreme situation you can imagine one 24-7 service that does all of this. Um, so these are big questions, as Dale has highlighted, uh, that are being discussed now. It will be horses for courses. I think solutions in one area, one hospital, will be different from another. Between countries, they will be different, and so on. And it's, you know, we're all in the same, same boat around the world. There are a few centers who are doing this already, and the rest of us have to play catch up. A really big question, and, and Avril alluded to this, is there simply aren't enough people trained to do this. And whether we should start training heart doctors or indeed vascular radiologists, so that's x-ray doctors who do intervention in the leg or the arm or the, or the gut, whether we should be cross-training, we don't know. Thank you very much, Philip. So we'll take the question over here, then the smiley lady who had her hand up, and then the third question will be the lady in the blue, I think it's blue and silver top, who's got her two hands in the air, she'll be the third question. <laughs> Madam. We have a number of people here. Why aren't we doing research at the conference? All of the participants who've had strokes could be answering questions or giving personal physical feedback for their own awareness. There is too little subjective work where the individual says, I, well, my arm's dead. They don't know they've got feeling in that arm because no one has touched it and asked them. I've done half a dozen people here today, all of whom were unaware their neurological processes were working part of the time. Just because they can't use it all of the time does not mean it's no longer part of their body. You've got such a mine of information here we could be using. Attitudinal change is what is needed for authority as well as researchers and participants because we expect to be done unto rather than be more part of the process. And until you bring the users in as part of the process and change the language to user-friendly and real language to be touched, to be stroked, and to find the arm is heavy or light so they are aware is something that is desperately needed. I mean, I, I'm going to try not to have a rant here, but one of my problems is that we, we are very strictly governed as researchers by what we can and can't do. So there is nothing to stop me coming to have a chat with you in an informal way about your experiences. But as soon as I call it research, I have a minefield to go through in terms of ethics and approvals, because that is to safeguard people. And I think that it's very important that we realise that getting ethical permissions and permissions to talk to people are important and they're there primarily to safeguard people. But actually, um, sometimes it's a real problem. And I often find that when I go out on the ward to try and consent people for studies, I sometimes feel I'm trying to sell them double glazing. And I'm obliged to give them an information sheet which is maybe three sides long. And all I'm asking them sometimes is to give them the treatment that I would normally be giving them. But as soon as it's research, I have to give them a form. And people are actually quite nervous. And I think there have been issues where, such as the Northwick Park trial, where there were problems in the way people were given medication, that sometimes people are very vulnerable and they really wonder what you're trying to sell them. 
So I think we still have some way to go with what I would call research governance and how we approach people and how we actually entice them into our studies. That's not just in stroke, that's across the board. Thank, thank you, Avril. In, can in the, can we the, cut the crap out of that and go to Parliament and say, we want the freedom to share our experience for research purposes? Good, good point, thank you. Uh, in order to keep us to time, I will take the next two questions that I indicated. Uh, at that point, I'm going to have to call a close to this part of the proceedings after those two questions, because there is some mild civil engineering required in this room to convert it to what happens later. But for those of you that have been trying to catch my eye, please keep your questions live in your mind, because when we get to the 12.35 session, the same two experts plus others will be here in forum for you to be able to ask all of the questions that you haven't had the chance to ask so far and others. So please don't feel I'm ignoring you. This is simply round one. So our penultimate question, please, madam. Thank you. We love stroke research. I'm not going to bang on about that, but sometimes I really struggle to find any, and I've been directed to various websites, and I can't really find anything. I would really love it if researchers could have a database that I could put myself in, or John in, <laughs> because they don't want to talk to me, and, yeah, and they could come to us. Can something to be done to make it easier for those of us who want to take part in research to find yes. it? A, a, a sort of a volunteer database. Yeah. It's, I think you raise a, a, a really good point, actually. I think it's something that we could do, actually, at the Stroke Association. What we do presently, we do advertise numerous studies that are going on, let survivors know, but we could, I think, in theory, have a database for stroke survivors and their families who wanted to be involved in studies. I think it's a good point you've raised. There's a gentleman who's been very... Uh, eager here to, to say something. Could you just shout and I'll repeat yes. your point. The, if you go to the Clinical Research Network uh, desk, there is information about it's okay to ask. And it's about asking researchers uh, and, uh, and finding out about the research uh, projects that are going ongoing. There are a number of research projects that are looking for participants and your GP or your hospital consultant can put you in touch with them. Go to the Clinical Research Network desk and ask for the information about the OK to Ask campaign. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good point. And our fine, sadly, our final question for this session before we come to round two later. Madam. Um, <clears throat> hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Webb for his brilliant information that he's given us today that is really really good my, my questions are very quick <clears throat> one is can a cholesterol clot do you know if a cholesterol clot can be removed by thrombe thrombectomy and the other question is at the point that somebody has a stroke when the ambulance is called or whatever um, can a diagnosis be made at that point as to whether it is an ischemic or um, a um, hemorrhagic stroke? Mm. That's it. Good questions. That's definitely for Professor. Absolutely. Do you want to come and sit up here, Philip? He's coming later. We need our bio break. Um, cholesterol clots are fairly uncommon causes of stroke, so um, the, the trials haven't focused on them. Um, I suppose that within the trials or within routine practice, people may find them from time to time, um, but I really don't know the answer to the question of whether you could remove them um, in the sense that they're rather different sort of clot, if you like, or embolus. In other words, a fragment of something that's gone from one part of the body to another uh, from the normal blood clot that these clot pulling trials were about. The second question was about ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke, so blood clot versus bleeding stroke. Can, can it be diagnosed in the ambulance? Um, the answer is, well, the two answers. There are trials that have been completed or are ongoing or are planned with CT scanners in the back of the ambulance. 
Um, unsurprisingly, if you can put a CT scanner in the ambulance, you can diagnose stroke earlier, and it allows you to give intravenous clot busting earlier, and people are now speculating that we could even do clot pulling earlier, perhaps also in a very large ambulance. Um, clearly putting a CT scanner in every ambulance is not practical, so there are, there are all sorts of issues of how that model might work, and it might work very differently in a large city from, say, a county such as Lincolnshire, which is the second biggest county in England, and the second lowest population and has the worst roads as far as I know for any county in England. So it's an absolute nightmare for moving emergencies around. So you can imagine different models there. The other, the other answer to that is there are people experimenting with blood tests, with ultrasound waves, with radio waves to see if you can separate hemorrhagic stroke, in other words bleeding from blood clot. But remember, you have to be 100% correct. We cannot give clot-busting drugs to bleeding strokes because that only has one outcome, I'm afraid. So there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Thank you for that, Philip.